we really appreciate, especially all the hospital employees coming and doing the informational um, mini health fair. So I hope you found that very um, helpful. So the big event, Russell Baxley joined Buford Memorial Hospital as president and chief executive officer on September of 2016. He um, was the CEO for Lancaster Regional Medical Center in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which I have called upon in my previous life. Um, Buford Memorial um, includes um, an inpatient psychiatric hospital, cancer, heart, and orthopedic programs, multiple sur surgical special specialties, and employees of physician group with more than 100 providers, and telemedicine as among other services. And they're also located down in the Bluffton area as well. Under Mr. Baxley's leadership, the hospital has developed and expanded critical services, including neurosurgery and oncology, constructed a 30,000 square foot facility with urgent care and a multitude of outpatient services, including physical and occupational therapies, sports medicine, imaging and internal medicine clinic, develop telemedicine, especially under recent COVID-19 um, conditions and population health management programs, and has recruited 20 primary care and specialty providers to meet the needs of the community and improve patient satisfaction sc scores across 10 key areas. A Johnsonville, South Carolina native, Mr. Baxley received his Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology from Clemson University. And he felt he needed to share the love between the two great institutions um, in South Carolina. He then went on and got his master's degree um, from the University of South Carolina. He has held roles as Chief Operating Officer, Assistant Chief Financial Officer, and Director of Development in small and mid-sized hospitals in both South Carolina, Texas, and including Carolina's Pines Regional Medical Center in Hartsville, South Carolina. Um, and Paris Regional Medical Center in Paris, Texas. He has also served as Director of Operations and Finance for a large family medicine practice and medical spa in Columbus, or sorry, Columbia, South Carolina. Mr. Baxley is a member of the American College of Healthcare Executives and has been actively involved in community and professional organizations and activities throughout his career. He and his wife, Stephanie, live in Buford. Before I hand over the mic to um, Mr. Baxley, um, I want to personally thank Kimberly Yawn, who has been very helpful in setting this whole program up, and also share. Um, some of you, a lot of you in this room, know that I was diagnosed with breast cancer in April of this year. And coming from the Philadelphia area, I'm being in medical sales for my career. I cannot say enough about the care that I received at Buford Memorial Hospital. And if I start welling up, um, it's with sincere and humble gratitude. Um, I had a fantastic surgeon who did my lumpectomy. Um, you know, I was consulted with both um, the oncologist, Dr. Newberry, the radiation oncologist, Dr. Briggs, both phenomenal doctors. And the care from start to finish, even with the breast navigator, I mean, they gave me a big bind, big book that I could reference anything in there. The care was exceptional. And, you know, I'm, everybody asked me how I'm doing. I'm doing great. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Mr. Baxley. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for having me. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, again, appreciate you guys having uh, myself and the Buford team here. We, we very much enjoy these presentations, and, and it was very good to be back doing presentations uh, after COVID-19, because I just was speaking with Kim, and I think I have 20 of these lined up over the next uh, 30 days. So I think we're trying to squeeze it all in for the last part of the year, because uh, we haven't done these in a couple of years. So it's exciting to get back on the road, uh, start talking about all the good things we're doing at Buford Memorial, and talk about things other than COVID. Because I know for the last couple of years, all we really spent time talking about is COVID-19 and the pandemic and our response to it. And so today is not going to focus on COVID-19, although I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. 
uh, on COVID-19. Today is about to focus on you know, where we're going in healthcare, where specifically Youth Memorial is going uh, in healthcare and how we deliver care to the community. Uh, for those that are maybe new to the area, uh, I'll give a little history lesson, but it'll be brief. So this was us in 1944. The unique thing about Butte Memorial uh, is we are actually a political subdivision of the state of South Carolina. We were written into legislation in 1944 as a 25-bed hospital uh, with four doctors on medical staff. Uh, and so we've grown tremendously since that 1944 hospital that you see there. Uh, this is us now. This is our uh, main health campus, but now we're 201 beds. Uh, of that 201 beds, 14 of that are inpatient rehab beds. Uh, 18 of those are adult mental health beds. We are the only adult mental health facility in a three county area. Uh, we have seven operating rooms, uh, currently about to be nine. We'll talk a little bit more about our renovations that are getting ready to happen. Uh, we have two cancer centers, uh, one north of the Broad here, uh, north of the Broad River, which is the Kaiserling Cancer Center, and our newest one south of the Broad River, which is the New River Cancer Center. Uh, and ambulatory surgery center, uh, with three ORs, you see the number of our services that we provide there, interventional cardiology, a labor delivery unit, uh, a robotic surgery, and the last bullet point, something new to the Beaver Memorial family, we do have a home health company now, the Beaver Memorial Home Health, uh, and a medicine partner. So we did partner uh, with the Medicine Home Health to buy two home health companies this past year, uh, and so now we're in the home health business uh, at Beaver Memorial, really just looking uh, at a continuum of care and how our patients transition from the hospital and to the home, and how we can be a part of that transition. We think that's important uh, now and definitely in the future. And that's one of the things COVID-19 uh, brought forward are such things as hospital at home. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. This is who we cared for last year. So being the largest hospital between Savannah and Charleston, uh, we care for the most people uh, of all hospitals between Savannah and Charleston. We do about 8,600 admissions and discharges uh, every year. Uh, we do about 215, 216,000 outpatient registrations, which would be a chemo infusion uh, appointment or radiation oncology or an MRI. Uh, 44,000 emergency department visits uh, a year. That's about 127 a day, give or take. So we see about 127 patients a day in the emergency room. By Medicare standards, that is a very busy emergency room. By 201 bed hospital standards, that's a very busy hospital room. I mean, emergency room. We probably admit, we do admit, uh, between 30 and 40 patients a day, right? So we admit the discharge 30 and 40 patients a day, uh, but 30 and 40 of those are coming from the ER easily, uh, being as busy as we are. Uh, we do 10,000 surgeries and growing, 1,000 deliveries, and uh, one of the other areas that we're growing and trying to grow quicker, uh, because we know there's an access to care issue in this community, is our physician network. We did 262,000 physician office visits last year. Um, and we will probably end up doing 275,000 to 290,000 this year as that physician network grows. So we continue to see our volumes increase as the community grows. We continue to try and recruit new physicians to, to, to expand that access to care that, that we need to do. Our financials last year, so every year has been a little bit tougher because of COVID. And uh, one of the things we'll talk about uh, today is also kind of the future of healthcare um, and kind of what to look, uh, look towards and look forward to. Um, some of that is some of the, uh, cost pressures that are on, on healthcare today and in the future. Uh, labor costs for our hospital is about $157 million a year, which is what we spend on labor, uh, contract salaries, uh, benefits. Uh, supplies $131 million, so we spend about $290 million a year uh, caring for the patients uh, in this community, which ends up being about $715,000 a day. So we spend about $715,000 a day at Youth Memorial. Uh, part of that is also charity care and bad debt. We do about $32 million in charity care to the community. Um, when I say charity care, that could be someone who comes to the ER and has no ability to pay. That can also be scheduled charity care, like our central cell anemia clinic, um, or charity care scheduled in our Kaiser Lake Cancer Center. So we do about $32 million in charity care every year. And then you see our total operating revenue there, which is about $290 million. So net net, we operate at about one point three million dollar margin, or at least that's what we did last year. Uh, two years ago, that was twelve million dollars. Uh, a couple years before that, that was about eighteen million dollars. And so you can see that inflation and COVID and the pandemic have had a material effect on the operations of the hospital. And it's not just us; it's, it's really every hospital uh, in the nation right now. It's really seen and finding new ways to do business and how to deliver care uh, given the inflationary pressures that are on hospitals and health systems right now. 
We also, a lot of times, like to brag about the quality of care we provide. So we in healthcare, like other industries, we invite a lot of outside organizations to come and survey our organization, give us best tips and what works well, what is not working well. And through all of these accreditation activities, we've won a ton of awards in the last year. Uh, one of the ones we're most proud of, and some of you have talked to me a little bit about your experience with our Total Joint Center, uh, but we are one of only three hospitals in the state of South Carolina that have the most advanced certification through the Joint Commission for hip and knee replacement. There's us, there's MUSC, and there's Greenville. That's it. Um, we're very proud of that. We continue to maintain the advanced center uh, for joint replacement through the Joint Commission uh, every year when they come and survey us. Uh, we have several awards with stroke and STEMI, COPD care, uh, several awards for the state of South Carolina for zero harm. Uh, for example, zero surgical site infections, zero classes or bloodstream infections. We have several of those awards. Uh, and most recently, we got another A rating from the LeapFrog Group. If you don't know who the LeapFrog Group is, they're an outside kind of watchdog agency. They come and survey other hospitals for the safety of the hospital. They look at falls, they look at uh, mortality rate, they look at infection rate, um, and they grade us on a fairly simple rating um, a model, A through F, with A being the best, F being the worst. Um, and we've gotten an A, I think, eight out of the last 10 rating cycles. The other two were Bs. Um, the last two specifically were A's, and we really can't announce this yet, but I'm going to tell you guys. Uh, we recently just awarded a top 150 hospital in the nation to the Leap Frog Group for safety of its patients and their outcomes. So we will be releasing that. We will be releasing that in December when it's no longer embargoed, right? They told us we can't announce it yet, uh, but we've been invited to Washington, D.C. to celebrate being a top 150 hospital in the nation for our outcomes and patient safety, which is um, really important, obviously, because when you enter the hospital, you want to make sure that um, we do three things for you, right? We always say this is don't harm me, heal me, be nice to me. With don't harm me, right, being the most important thing, all of them being important, right? But we're very proud that we don't harm our patients and we heal them um, uh, versus the alternative. So very proud of that. All right, the future of healthcare is now. So one of, the, uh, one of my focuses today on the presentation is all the new technology we've brought to people over the last couple of years. You know, we haven't spoken a lot about it. We haven't been able to get out on the road and talk about all the new technology we have. Um, but it's important because this new technology allows us to better deliver better results. Um, it allows us to get our patients home quicker um, and you heal faster. And that's important. Uh, so I'll focus first on joints. And so in the last couple of years, we have implemented and uh, acquired two robots now uh, for hip and knee replacement. Uh, we do over a thousand joints a year in growing. And now we have started, and half of those joints are done robotically uh, through the Pew robot, or the uh, Mako Strike a robot right there. And what happens is, is we take a CT scan and we make a very specific knee. We put that CT scan uh, into that robot and it helps the surgeon uh, with guided cuts, right? As a very specific surgery for our patients. And we have seen great, uh, great returns on this, we have seen great outcomes. Uh, on this particular robot, uh, we have seen patients go home uh, more and more the same day. We are doing same day surgery now for both hip and knee. Um, now, Medicare asked us to start doing that two years ago. Um, Medicare actually um, wants you to go home the same day, and so they actually pay us to make sure you go home the same day, believe it or not. Uh, now, if you have other comorbidities and otherwise need to stay, obviously we work with the Medicare to make sure you stay a day, two days, whatever you need. Uh, but we actually have more and more patients asking to go home same day, and we are putting more and more patients home same day. Um, and uh, the robot helps us do that. Uh, doctors uh, Mark Dean, Del Gazzo, Kevin Jones, uh, Vanda Sardana, Ned Blocker, they're all doing robotic surgery now at uh, Beaufort Memorial Hospital. Um, we did 500 robotics uh, last year. We will probably do 600 to 700 robotic uh, replacements this year as well uh, for hip and knee replacements. So very, very happy. Uh, about this program of where this is headed. Other robotic upgrades, so you see right there that robot with all the arms, that is the newest uh, Da Vinci XI. Uh, the Da Vinci XI allows us to do minimally invasive um, uh, general surgery, like hernia repair, uh, colorectal surgery, uh, urology, gynecology. So we have upgraded our older platform, which is the Da Vinci SI, into the Da Vinci XI, and allows us now to do thoracic surgery and everything else robotically. Again, the robot allows the surgeons to have um, a minimally invasive approach, smaller incisions, faster healing time, you're in the hospital less days uh, with this, and you're back on your feet doing what you want to be doing after surgery. Um, that was actually about a $2.5 million robot 
um, that was purchased about a year ago. And then the cardiac cath lab coming soon. So we do about 500 uh, cardiac catheterizations a year, about half of those emergently through the ER. Uh, someone comes in a chest pain, we take them to the cath lab, uh, possibly uh, need to stent them, etc. We do 500 and grow in a year, and now we are upgrading our cath lab to a brand new state of the art um, angio suite that allows us not only to do cardiac interventions, um, but peripheral vascular interventions as well. Um, so we're upgrading the newest technology in our cath lab. That's also a two and a half million dollar project um, that's currently underway at the hospital right now. <laughs> and then you got a little preview of the Kaiserlin Cancer Center earlier, but um, we have upgraded both over the last five years, um, both of our uh, radiation oncology centers. And we have the newest variant linear accelerator technology, which essentially means you don't have to go to Charleston or Savannah to get the most state-of-the-art cancer care. You can stay right here in Newford. We partner with MUSC. This is an affiliated MUSC cancer center, as is the New River Cancer Center South of the Bronx. Um, and all the services in both locations uh, are located under one roof. Uh, that would be medical oncology, surgical oncology, nurse navigation, social work. Everything is always located, uh, dietetics, uh, therapy. Uh, everything is located under one roof, which is important because we want to make um, whatever trips you're making to the cancer center, we want to make them as effective and as efficient as possible. Uh, which is why we like the cancer center approach. You'll see a couple uh, new and surgical specialists that we just recruited to the area. Uh, the one on the left is Dr. Tara Verhoeven. She is a fellowship trained breast surgeon. Uh, she just started with us about six months ago. She's mostly based in Okatee, but practices in both Okatee and Buford, and does uh, breast surgery uh, in Buford. And then you see Dr. Elizabeth Chapitan right there. She's our newest pulmonologist, but she's actually interventionally trained. Uh, and endoscopic rocket ultrasound, which allows her to do lung nodules, uh, biopsies, etc. A lot of times we had to send those patients to Charleston to have an EBIS, and now you can stay right here in Newfield. So we continue to grow our cancer program, we continue to recruit new specialists to the area that we've never had before. We're very excited about, about both Dr. Rehovic uh, and Dr. Elizabeth Chapitan because they bring new services um, and can do new procedures that we've never done before in Newfield Memorial. Uh, so very excited about the two of them and growing our cancer program. Big things coming to be for Memorial. So these are our two biggest projects we are working on right now. One is 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 South Abroad, and I feel like I've been talking about the hospital in Bluffton for, for four years, and I have, uh, because it is still tied up in litigation uh, through the state of South Carolina and other health systems in the area. That is very much still uh, uh, on the docket for us to accomplish. We very much still have the land. We very much still are moving forward with the administrative law courts and litigation, trying to expand our network, trying to grow our reach. Uh, and who we serve, and we think specifically in Bluffton, that's a great next step for us as a health system as we continue to evolve as an organization. Uh, and then the oil renovation, so that is currently underway. Uh, we are getting to construction documents uh, currently and hope to go for permitting in the January timeframe of 2023. But this is a $24 million project that is on the docket, and we're excited about this because uh, it's going to bring all of our rooms up to state-of-the-art operating suites with new uh, flat screens, new imaging systems, new anesthesia uh, booms, uh, new beds. Uh, everything that you would otherwise expect to see in a state-of-the-art hospital will be in this facility uh, and our new ORs. All the ORs will be bigger. That's important because well, we have a lot of robots. And as we grow our robotics program and we grow other subspecialties, we need larger rooms than what we currently have. So it's important to expand the rooms. It will also uh, be adding a new state-of-the-art endoscopy suite. Um, we do uh, about 400 to 500 scopes a month uh, at Beef Memorial, and that is still not enough to cover the waterfront. Uh, and so we need to add larger and new state-of-the-art suites as well and recruit more gastroenterologists. So as part of the oral innovation, um, we are expanding and adding endoscopy suites as well. And so again, a $24 million project will add two ORs because not only have we added uh, a breast surgeon, we've added a general surgeon, we've added a new board certified spine surgeon, uh, Dr. Andy Castro, another joint surgeon, um, as well as you saw uh, Dr. Chapitan for uh, endoscopic bronchial ultrasound, we're adding more gastroenterologists as well. So as we grow our physician and medical staff, they need places to operate, um, they need places to practice. Uh, we are already as full as we can possibly be in our ORs, and so we need to add two more. Um, and so that's currently our big project that we're working through right now. It'll be about a two-year project that should actually say scheduled to be complete, I think, in early 2025. Um, but it will be about a two-year project um, because 
you obviously have to still operate. We can't take down the entire operating suite uh, to renovate uh, all of our ORs, so we will take down two operating suites at a time uh, and still operate on the other ORs. Um, and so that is kind of the cadence in which it will take two, two years essentially. It's two at a time at about, a, I would say, a three to four month clip. Um, as well as the PACU, the pre-op area, the endoscopy suites, the central sterile area, we do all the processing of the equipment. All that is being renovated with brand new equipment. Um, this is a very fun project, um, and we are thankful to uh, Senator Lindsey Graham's office, actually, because he actually was able to help us come through with an $18 million grant to help fund this project. Uh, the foundation uh, has come up with almost $4 million, $5 million uh, to help fund this as well, so between uh, the foundation and all of their great work and support uh, and all the donors to the foundation as well as Senator Graham, we may able to basically fund this without having to go into debt. Um, which is important because one of the things we did over the pandemic as well is we actually paid down all debt even from all that. So we can say we're one of the only hospitals I think that I've ever heard of that has no outstanding debt whatsoever, um, period. So we are, we are debt free. We did that about two years ago, paid down all of our bonds. Um, to, to uh, offload any interest that we were carrying. Okay. And then health care. So here is the other big thing we are focusing on, and I think something that should be important to all of us. Um, health care on the brink, the workforce shortage crisis. So this is, this is the number one thing on every CEO's mind right now. Uh, between that and financial challenges that we face because of inflation and COVID pandemic, is how are we going to staff our facilities in the next three, five, and ten years? So I just told you we want to build another hospital, we're going to build two more operating suites, we're going to recruit all these physicians to the area. The problem is going to be is who's going to support these physicians? That is the crisis that we face. I will tell you um, a couple of stats. South Carolina by 2030 is projected to be between eight and 10,000 nurses short of the demand. Uh, eight to 10,000 nurses short of the demand predicted in the state of South Carolina. It's about, it's about 70 to 80,000 on, e on the East Coast, give or take, Southeast East Coast, uh, nurses short um, in terms of the demand. Um, financial pressures. So a couple of things facing hospitals today. Uh, Kaufman Hall, Fitch, Forrester, some of the consulting firms that are out there that produce all these reports that we look at on the regular. Um, said the hospital expenses are set to increase by $135 billion in 2023. $135 billion. Healthcare is already in the, what is it, 17, 18, 19% of the GDP already. Just think what $135 billion is going to do to that. Um, and what hospitals are continuing to see negative margins. Um, did a presentation, um, Bill and I were just talking about this, did a presentation at the uh, foundation annual meeting last week. And one of the stats I said is that uh, Kaufman Hall says 600 hospitals right now are at risk of closure. Mm -hmm. um, most of those are in rural uh, southern states. Uh, but 600 hospitals, as we sit here today, are at risk of closure per Kaufman Hall and all the reports, giving you bad financial outcomes due to COVID-19. So financial pressures are real in healthcare right now, more so than we've ever seen before. Uh, payment cuts. So the funny thing about you know everything we see about inflation and cost rising and everything else is Medicare is actually getting ready to cut physician payments by four and a half percent, right? So is so is uh, and I have a family medicine doctor uh, right up here from Connecticut, and we were talking a little shop earlier. But as costs go up, Medicare is trying to cut physician payments by four and a half percent. Now we have a big physician network. We employ about 100 plus providers in our physician network and growing. So if Medicare follows through and cuts physician payments by four and a half percent, that's almost two million dollars to be more that would be cut year over year to physician payments. Right? We're hoping Medicare doesn't do it. We're hoping legislature steps in and says, hold on a minute, we can't afford for physicians to take a 4.5% pay cut given what recently just happened with COVID-19, but that has not happened yet. Um, so we are waiting for legislature to intervene. Uh, hospitals are getting about a 3.9 to 4% increase, but our costs are up 15%. So the comment to Medicare from hospitals and health, health systems is, well, 4% is nice. It was nice in 2018, but your, your, your average 4% increases aren't going to cut it when hospitals expenses are up 15% right now. Supply chain problems, unfortunately, we still see supply chain problems. We still can't get IV catheters sometimes. We still can't get suction tubing sometimes. I, I kid you not, it is a daily struggle trying to figure out how we're going to supply the hospital because 
for whatever reason, this plant has shut down, or this transport company isn't working, or something has happened. So hospitals are still struggling sometimes with supply checking, and our uh, GPO vendors, group personal organization vendors, say don't expect much to improve until Christmas of 2023. So that is their prediction in terms of supply chain problems until Christmas of 2023. Rise of the Great Resignation, um, we, we still struggle uh, as hospitals and healthcare providers and staff. Uh, draw to travel nursing became a real big thing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we're already short nurses. That was a known thing going into the pandemic. The pandemic only uh, increased that shortage. We've seen turnover increase. We've seen the time to fill vacant positions increase. Um, and, and we have not necessarily seen people entering into the nursing workforce. Actually, we just met with the NUSC School of Nursing today. Um, I will tell you there are certain programs for the first time in history that are actually not filling every open nursing slot for their schools. Um, they, are, they, they do not have enough applications. Typically, it's the other way around. Typically, they turn away more nurses than they have available slots. Uh, for the first time in years, there are less people applying to nursing school than there ever have been before. Some of that is blamed on the pandemic. Um, Hospitals and healthcare were, uh, and nurses were heroes at first, um, and that's not necessarily the case anymore. Um, and so people have gone into other fields. Uh, rising cost of living, so I will tell you 8.5%, uh, 7%, wherever it's going to fall over the next couple of months um, is still high. Uh, but Bu Buford is unique in that um, we've always had high cost of living, uh, and this is only, I think, accelerating that a little bit. Uh, I have a stat up there that says 1843 is the self-sufficiency standard. That was a study that was done prior to COVID. Um, but that basically is an is a hourly wage prior to COVID that says a mother, um, a single mother with child, that's what it would cost for them to sustain themselves in Beaver County. That's the highest in the state of South Carolina. Um, the lowest was 12, the average is about 14 to 15. Beaver County has the highest in terms of a self-sufficiency standard. That is a problem for employers, obviously, like Youth Memorial. Um, as we work to increase wages, uh, we have to increase those higher than most because our self-sufficiency standards and these sorts of numbers are higher than just about anywhere else in the state of South Carolina. Affordable housing shortage, I won't dwell on that. You guys can read the Island News and get all you want for affordable housing. Uh, and then lastly, clinician burnout. Um, that is really attributed, uh, or really a big part of people's of the great resignation, especially in healthcare. Just pure sheer burnout. I mean, people are tired, you see it, um, the waves, they come and go. Right now, we are in another mini wave, but uh, I think what's worse is flu and RSV is a big thing right now. So we're dealing with flu, RSV, COVID-19, uh, it comes and it goes, but you can see burnout in clinicians um, every day after the pandemic. And so what we say is, at Beaver Memorial, how do we find innovative solutions to dynamic problems? And I can tell you, staffing, uh, is a dynamic problem and how we're going to recruit and retain uh, our staff and how we're going to fill a new hospital and two new ORs. That is a problem. It's, it will require dynamic <coughs> solutions. And so we've done a lot of things at Beaufort Memorial. Specifically, we've put installed burnout mitigation platforms. We've done things like sports rounds, which is just for day, first day. We provide applications or apps on your iPhone uh, if you want to do uh, burnout and stress relief. Uh, on your own time. We've provided housing assistance. We actually help people with down payments for homes uh, at Beaver Memorial, and we actually have our own daycare now, uh, where we provide daycare for our employees. Um, and lastly, one of the things we've started most recently that uh, was showcased by the South Carolina Hospital Association for being probably the most innovative solution of all hospitals is our Beaver Memorial PATH program. And that PATH stands for people achieving their highest. And one of the things we've started to realize is if we don't create our own solutions, the solutions aren't going to be presented for us. They're just not going to happen. Um, they weren't happening before. They're definitely not going to happen after the pandemic. And so we are creating our own school, if you will, within the Memorial. It started with patient care techs and certified nursing assistants and certified medical assistants and phlebotomists. Uh, we have partnered with the National Healthcare Association. We have handpicked, I think, uh, high performers in our entry-level positions, and we are turning them into clinicians. Um, we're basically taking our transporters and our patient access clerks. Uh, anyone else who we think would be a good caregiver and said, you know what, you've got the right attitude, you've got the right personality, you've got the right work ethic, we're going to teach you how to become a healthcare provider. We're going to teach you how to be a clinician at the bedside. Which is good because we need them, but it's great for them because it allows them to continue to grow and elevate within the organization. Um, and so it's a win-win for everybody. 
Uh, and we've also started reaching out to job fairs saying, you know what, healthcare experience is not required. Most hospitals and health systems say, you know what, healthcare experience, you don't have it, you need not apply. We've said just the opposite. We want the right person, we want the right attitude, we will teach you how to be a healthcare provider. Right? We will put you in our school with the National Healthcare Association, we will get you certified, we will turn you into a clinician, but you've got to have the right attitude, you've got to have the right work ethic, you've got to have the right desire to be that, to go above and beyond. Um, and that's what the PAC program is. So we've already graduated 16 people who are on the bedside now, doing phenomenally, by the way. We've got another six that are going through to become patient care techs. Um, we've got another 20 people right now in the nursing program uh, through TCL and USCB on scholarships through the PAC program. So we really are working hard to start growing our own healthcare workforce in Beaufort County. One of the biggest, and I think I'll call it the crescendo, one of the, what we think is going to be the crowning achievement at Beaufort is we are going to build our own nursing school. Now, we are not going to become an accredited nursing school. Um, I wouldn't know the first thing about becoming an academic um, uh, school, but what we are doing is we're partnering with the University of South Carolina Beaufort. Um, they need more skills labs, they need more classrooms, they don't necessarily have the funding to do it. So we've gone and helped to secure about one and a half million dollars in funding uh, through different grants um, and partners, and we are going to build four nursing skills labs um, with state-of-the-art mannequin technology that will help train nurses of the future. Uh, we will build classrooms and debrief rooms and testing centers. We want to actually help USCB create 72 nursing slots a year. Um, that is the goal and what we ultimately have to do and achieve uh, here in order to grow our, our network, grow our health system, and recruit the physicians and build the facilities that we want. And so we are very, very close to breaking ground on a satellite nursing school for the University of South Carolina Beaufort and possibly in the USC. Um, the other pathway here is that we want to start um, an accelerated nursing program. An accelerated nursing program is for those who already have a four-year degree that want a career change, right? I'm in marketing, I'm in engineering, I'm in, I'm in something different. You know what, I want to get into healthcare. And I have all the prereqs, right? I've got my four-year bachelor's. I just need to get the nursing side of things. Um, MUSC has an accelerated nursing program. They do the same thing. We want to start one here in order to let other people get into the healthcare field industry. And this facility is going to help us do that um, with USCB. And so this is new, it's innovative, it's dynamic, and it's a solution for that next three to five years as we go down this road of workforce shortages and how healthcare is changing. Um, and so, lastly, a little bit more of an appeal to this group because we've kind of gotten out of the bricks and mortar, or, hey, we want money for bricks and mortar. What we need is we need help for workforce development. Um, we need help creating these pathways and programs um, specifically for the PAC program. So, you, Kim was here, she was introduced. Kim has done a phenomenal job as our foundation director. Um, she's new to the role, but uh, is one of those go-getters that I know is just going to do great things with the foundation. Um, but this is some of the things that we've done. You see right there on the left, um, granted in scholarships last year, 41,000. We want that number to be 100,000. We want that number to be $100,000 a year in scholarships granted to nurses and patient care techs and certified medical assistants because, again, we can recruit all the physicians in the world, but they don't have nurses and certified medical assistants and patient care techs and phlebotomists and respiratory therapists to serve them. I can tell you, you spend more time with each of those people than you ever spend with your doctor. Right? If you're in the hospital, how often do you see your doctor? Ten minutes in the morning, right? How often do you see your nurse? All day, every day, right? All day, every day. It's those nurses and those therapists that make the hospital go, right? And that's what we need. That's what we need to focus on in the next three to five years. And so part of the strategic funding and priorities for the foundation this year, specifically the work with the the Education Center, uh, we've secured about one and a half million dollars in grants right now. We need another about $750,000 to make that a true reality. Uh, scholarships, the daycare center, uh, we secured a million dollars to build a new daycare center on campus. We need about another 500000 for that. Um, but that is kind of where the foundation is focused, as well as the mental health uh, area. Mental health is a major problem right now, as you guys are probably aware. Um, there's not enough providers, and there's too much need. Uh, and so we're renovating our emergency room to have a very site-specific um, uh, mental health part portion of it. Um, because there are some days I will walk in there, and we will have eight mental health patients waiting for placement, um, being evaluated, um, needing to go somewhere else in the state because we don't provide that particular service. They need a safer place to, work, to, to wait. They need a separate place to be evaluated and assessed and rounded on. Um, so we are going to build a very specific mental health 
uh, unit within our emergency room, which keeps the, um, <coughs> the aches, the pains, the trauma, the STEMIs in one section, and it keeps the mental health patients um, that can receive, I think, very unique specialized care that they need in another section of the ER. Um, and lastly, in the initial cap lab number two, and in building number one, we will be building number two to add electrophysiology uh, physicians to the area. That way, you don't have to go to Charleston, Savannah for EP work as well. So that's kind of the next step of the evolution. So a lot of big things planned. Um, kind of scary times in healthcare. Um, yeah, I, there's, there's always a problem in healthcare. There's, there's always something to tackle. I was just uh, reviewing my first six years here uh, in Newford. The first year was, I think, two hurricanes. Uh, then we were okay for a while, then we had a pandemic, and now we're probably in one of the um, more dire financial crises in healthcare um, they've seen in a long, long time. Um, and I don't know, I told the board the other day, I don't think it will take us two years to figure this out. Um, I said it's going to take us a solid two years to figure out the new way of doing business in healthcare. We'll do it, because uh, we always have. Um, but I don't see things ever going back to the way they were. Um, they can't, they won't. They, have, they, they shouldn't, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we need to change. Um, so this is going to push us in that direction. So with that, that is kind of our rallying cry at the hospital. The staff came up with this uh, about a couple years ago, right before COVID, and it was uh, it was never more important than than during COVID when we always say one vision, one purpose, no limits to, to what we can achieve as a community hospital. Uh, so with that, I will uh, I will open it up to to questions. Uh, anyone have any questions? Anything I didn't cover or anything that uh, maybe you want more information on? I'm happy to answer.